Cool, so hi, I'm Carl, I'm from Packet. Ed from Packet, Sahaj from 96 Boards, David from Minionodes. Hi, everybody. We're here to talk about designing a next generation ARM developer platform. Um, I'm going to let David take us through the history because he yeah. put together these slides. Yeah, so I put together some slides uh, and we did this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, which we got for, our slides done early, so yeah, there's, there's some we were probably stuff that's going to be filled in. The first one to submit slides, which is a first, but. I like to the be problem now is that this conversation has actually exploded over the past couple of weeks. So our slides are not perhaps as current as could be, but we'll talk through that. Yeah. Um, and I see a few folks are still trickling in, so just a quick recap of what we discussed earlier is we are going to go through our slides really, really quickly. The point of this presentation is not necessarily for us to present everything. It's really to have a dialogue and a conversation with yep. the community. So what we'll do is we'll go through our slide deck, talk through one proposed solution to the problem that we see, um, but knowing that there are many tools available in the toolbox right. to solve this problem. So. Um, <laughs> I see you have been clicking through. <laughs> if you guys they can, have been they can read tweets, it's fine. Seeing <laughs> some of the some of the tweets, there has been a lot of dialogue and debate in the social media platforms about the need for an ARM developer workstation. Call it a NUC style box. Call it an ARM developer box. Um, there have been some attempts at this in the past, which have had pros and cons associated with them. Um, like I just said a moment ago, there's probably not one perfect solution to the problem anyway. Nope. But um, there is still some, uh, still some desires um, to build a small, cheap, standards-based unit that ARM developers can uh, make use of. And so I think at this point, actually, I'll turn it over. Carl, do you want to take this one or Ed, where we get to the point of, uh, of where Linus sort of threw um, a curveball at us? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so the, um, just a, just from a little bit of background, so I work with a lot of developers uh, through the Works on ARM program, and uh, we have people coming to us. They say, "Well, we need something to do our work," and I say, "Well, here's 96 cores," and they say, "Well, I only need eight, right? I only need four. Is there anything I can put on my desk on my desktop?" Um, but they're developing for a server ecosystem. They're not developing for an embedded ecosystem, and so they need the full range of develop a server-ready application thing, but in a form factor that's, that's smaller. Um, and as it so happens at Packet, we're a bare metal cloud provider, uh, we also need that same thing, right? Because we, we want to provide a server at a price point that's low enough that people can just turn it up for their in incidental needs or small footprint needs rather than always having a big big footprint on stuff. Yeah. So the, the, pr the problem is not a problem, it's an opportunity. The ARM market, the ARM ecosystem, has lots of little things in it. And it has very little in the middle, and it has enough big things to be interesting. And it's that piece in the middle where the developer who's used to putting a 8-core, 12-core, 16-core multiple SATA drives, multiple SSDs box on their desktop to do whatever their work is, is developing for, frankly, for x86 first, because that's what's staring at them in the face every day. And there's not that equivalent box, for the most part, for them to be able to do the same thing for, for ARM. And until we get that same kind of desktop mind share, or laptop mind share, or in this case, desktop mind share, um, just being able to solve the uh, litany of small problems and minor inconsistencies and developer hiccups um, doesn't happen because 
people missing that particular device turn to cross builds instead of native builds. So their whole build tool chain, and I'll be talking about this on, on Thursday, the whole build chain becomes completely x86 dependent um, to the point where you can't do a native build without doing a whole lot of work on your build system and chances are good that if you're an expert in some application, the last thing you want to do is not think about that application and think about your build system. Yeah. So with that, hand cool. to you. Thanks. So we have a problem. What are we going to do about it? Um, a lot of people have talked about it. We basically sat down on our weekly conference call um, at, through Works on Arm, please join us, um, and said, you know what? We can do something about this, so let's. Only we can't call it a knuck because certain large blue companies might sue us. So we're gonna call it a duck instead. Um, the first thing that we decided to do was like, what do we want? What do we think needs to be in something like this? And we put together a bunch of specifications. We didn't even care about whether it's gonna be supported or possible. It's just what, if it was perfect, what would it be? And this is kind of what we came up with. And that seems reasonable. Um, the, the big one on the top right is probably the most important. <laughs> um, and then we were like, okay, cool. How, how do we get there? Um, and then there's some issues with those requirements. So first of it was expandable memory is hard. DRAM training is hard. Memory controllers is hard. It's all hard. Um, so what if we embrace that as an advantage instead of trying to reinvent the wheel? and take advantage of the 96 board SOM specification for compute and make it so that you can drop in different modules. You want a new processor? No problem. Pop the old one off, pop the new one on, different memory configurations, all sounds great. Um, form factor, making something that is the same form factor as a some semi-proprietary system developed by a large company is also hard. We have to deal with a lot of power management things. We have to deal with how we're gonna deal with cooling. We decided to instead, let's just embrace the PC ecosystem, make it mini ITX, make things a little bit better, and then go for diversity of connectors. One carrier board, any SOM you want to put on it, you're not necessarily going to get all the same features on the SOM, but that from, depending on what the SOM implements, but that's okay. Um, we want it to be software based, because, excuse me, we want it to be EBBR based, because software is the problem. Graphics and video is a problem. This is David's big one. He wants to be able to play full screen YouTube without it turning into a smoldering crater, um, which can be done. And a lot of that is just drivers. And how do we solve that problem is just by embracing the ecosystem and letting the people who are doing the right stuff of upstreaming things win uh, and kind of go from there. So with that, we have put together this highly technical two scale production ready diagram of how this would work. Um, it kind of looks like this. And because it's 2019, we put an RGB addressable header on it because you gotta have an RGB addressable header. Um, but this is kind of what we're thinking about. Um, and this is the sort of thing that we wanna start building. Is it gonna be perfect? No. Is it gonna support every use case that everyone wants? No, but that's okay. It's a starting point because our feeling is make something and we can make it better and take advantage of the pieces that are there. Don't try and start from a blank piece of paper, start from all the pieces that already exist on the ecosystem, build on the ecosystem strengths, and kind of move forward from there. Um, we're basically breaking out all of the stuff through the SOM specification onto this carrier board that's a standard form factor with all the connectors in the right position and the PCI Express connectors in the right position and all that fun stuff. So if your SOM doesn't support SATA right now, those SATA connectors will not do anything. That's a question. Is that something that we want, or do we want to like put in some extra work to put in a PCI Express switch so that we can go, okay, even if there isn't SATA on the board, do we want to have SATA on the board that would work otherwise that isn't necessarily native? That's the kind of feedback that we're looking for. Uh, positive and negative feedback. Bunch of current options for things that we could look at. So, so Hajj probably wants to talk about this a little bit. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so... Um with the Snapdragon uh, chipsets, uh, so I mean we have the SBSA and uh, SBBR, EBBR problem, but uh, if we kind of sidetrack just a second, just take a look at what the hardware we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, for the Snapdragon stuff, uh, we have the advantage that the GPU is open source. We don't really need a graphics card unless you want to play um, Crisis, but that's okay. Um, 
we can play some other games that run on ARM. Mm -hmm. um, so the Freedino works really well, um, and we have uh, some good performance on there. Um, some people have claimed that 385 uh, is uh, close to an i7 or something. Um, and then Layerscape has a bunch of good offering. Uh, interestingly, we did see a workstation-like device launch a couple of a week back, and yep. our slides are outdated. <laughs> And then um, there are some Marvel chipsets that David um, came across, the Octeon ones. Um, and I was testing the current 970. Mani did a bunch of upstreaming work on that. So that has, uh, that has PCI and other stuff working. Um, again, we are kind of ignoring the eBBR problem right now. We'll come back to it um, on yeah. a later time because that's important as well. And this is a great place to talk about the elephant in the room. So uh, Solid Run announced their CloudFog ITX project earlier this week, uh, which we were all excited about. Um, how does this fit in with that? ARM is a huge diverse ecosystem. Having multiple options is not a bad thing. Um, so they're going for something with a, a different form factor, which is not a bad thing. Um, they're going to be using that LX2160A uh, chip, which we're kind of excited about. Um, we kind of wanted to take an approach of taking more off-the-shelf stuff with 96 boards to try and get something to market a little bit faster, because as it turns out, the Solid Run project has been going on for quite some time, um, and uh, see what we can do. So, yeah, at this point, questions and discussions, because we're actually on time and only spent 15 minutes going through our slides. <laughs> I'm going to put up contact info if folks want to talk to us afterwards, later, but yeah, go for it. And then, well, I'll huddle around a microphone and answer questions. <laughs> so in your early initial thing, you mentioned how like the 96 board stuff is not exactly what people want. And now your plan is to use a 96 board SOM. As, so as a start, yeah. So, so what's actually missing there? Because all that thing said, exposed PCIe, which I didn't think was exposed on the 96 board SOMs. It is, yes. OK. Yeah. Yep. Two four-lane PCI uh, on the X2 and the X4 high-speed connector on the SOM. How many of the current SOMs expose that? Yeah, uh, the SOM outside I think exposes only one because of the SOC limitation, and then that's broken out. But you can put a SOC on there that has those many PCI in it will expose. But do those exist today? How many of those exist today? Uh, at the moment. We only released the yeah. Rock Chip one right now. Okay, That's so there is only one song that this could possibly be useful for today. Right. The stuff that just announced yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, there, there is there is other stuff in development, um, and the, in the yeah, there's there's definitely stuff in the pipeline that just hasn't been announced yet. Um, so at this point, it's just a matter of seeing what's going to happen, and we're talking with folks because, to your point, um, four cores, four gig of RAM, not exactly the best place to be. But if you look at the Snapdragon part that's in the phone on my belt, that's eight cores and 10 gig of RAM. That's a lot more exciting. Um, maybe we can do something with that. And we're leveraging our opportunity, or we're leveraging our relationship with Qualcomm at Packet to try and engage them to do something like this. Having it on a SOM 4 factor means it's cheaper for them to manufacture, and it can be used in multiple applications. Sure. Um I will note that there are laptops shipping today mm -hmm. that meet the majority of those requirements modulo not currently running Linux. Correct. How does this compare in that, to that in terms of price point? And how, because those are shipping today. Yeah, and no, if absolutely. the big problem is software, yes. that's something that could be addressed without having to wait for all those pipelines of multiple pieces of hardware to come out, get aligned, for all that software to actually get written. To, make those, to bring those up to speed with what's currently out there. Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. And the problem there, as you pointed out, is software. So all of those things that exist, uh, the biggest problem with them is the bootloader, because they all only boot Windows. And they have an implementation that only allows booting Windows. So we're working with the manufacturers to try and fix that. But it's not something that we can just snap our fingers and make those work without getting out a soldering iron and making changes to it. Um, but in the 96 boards ecosystem, a lot more opportunities are available to us because we can push on things like eBBR to have a UEFI that will do something other than just load Windows or just load a Linux kernel. We can load Grub and do an actual installation. <laughs>
So that happens today on these laptops. These laptops boot Linux today badly, slowly, but mm -hmm. they do. So they have a have baked EFI implementation, but right. it's, a, it's an EFI implementation. Yeah. So and the bootloader is the least of the problems. The real problem is the documentation on the SOC itself, mm -hmm. which is completely non-existent and, and kept private for yeah. good or bad reasons. How do you think you're going to all of a sudden turn some you know, company like Qualcomm around releasing that documentation without which we can't do anything? Okay, so I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> So the, the answer to that is Alliance is an ecosystem. Um, the reason why those boards boot, the reason why those systems boot Linux badly is because the people who made those systems had a partnership of it's going to run, run a very specific operating system and it's not going to support standards like eBBR. We think this is an absolutely solvable problem. It's just somebody needs to stand up and say, this is the sort of thing that we want, and we're willing to dump the resources in to make Again, it happen. Again, booting is the least of the issues. Booting, we've done that already. Mm -hmm. How do you intend to solve all the problems related to power, man power management, non-standard IPs, um, pseudo ACPI tables, which are quite um, I think by booting, we mean all of that, like having a system booted up that runs perfectly. Has, yeah. has a full UEFI, does eBBR, and has an upstream kernel, and put it on it, not, not just. So yeah. if, you, if you have a full UEFI, why are you going for eBBR? Well, UEFI implements eBBR. Um, I mean, the eBBR spec, sorry, has UEFI as well, and you boot. Um, the. Um, so Go for it. No. I, I was just going to fill in on this. So you're talking about having a BMC on this thing. You're talking about fully standards compliant, being able to run all operating systems. Right. I realize that there might be corner. I can't think of them right now. There might be corner cases that might be lacking from the hardware design that might make it impossible to fully be SBSA compliant and SBBR. Yes. But realistically, surely what you must be aiming for is everything you could do along that, only mm -hmm. technically it might not fit all the letters, so you might have to call it eBBR. The scary thing about saying eBBR is that eBBR is, especially at its current level, it's very permissive of leaving things out in order to not, because it's, it's fully focused on the embedded market, which this isn't. Right, so, so absolutely, but the, the point here is People have been trying to do something that is perfect for a long time and not making any headroom. We basically want to take components that are available today, try and get something in the hands of people, and then we can iterate and go from there. You know, when, when the Raspberry Pi first came out, it wasn't the awesome open ecosystem that it was today. What made that happen was having it be available and having people being able to make changes to it. Part of the reason why we want to go down this route is because having something is better than having nothing. And instead of everybody just complaining about it on Twitter, we figured we'd try and take a stab at it. Is it, is it going to be completely successful? Maybe not, but we can always iterate and move forward. My point is that I think I've heard you say eBBR about 15 times, and what you're actually trying to do is a lot more than eBBR. Yes, yes. I mean, the. One of the design goals beyond the thing that sits on the developer desktop is to take that same design and make it suitable for being a cloud server. So that means, yes, the BMC has to be really good, and yes, you have to deal with all of those boot issues, not through some goofy mechanism that's half standard, but that's you know straightforward to do. Yeah. And, and I think you know, thinking just a little bit beyond the what do I put on my desk to what can I put into a standard rack in quantity elevates that requirement a little bit. It may make it more obvious that the current SOMs that we have are missing things. Um, but, you know, we're not just trying to get something on someone's desk. Right. You know, eventually we're trying to get a system, infrastructure system spun up so that there's a common set of goals that land something on someone's desktop and some kind of reasonable cloud bootable system. And I, and I think that's really good. I just think it's also important that you emphasize that 
because I, I know for a fact that some, maybe not in this room, but certain people at this conference who would listen to this talk and think that they could go away and, oh, I have an EBBR compliant chip, I can do the same thing. So, so uh, the reason why we say EBBR and not SBSA, SBBR is that we discussed that. And there might be also a reason for a DBBR, like a desktop yeah. version, and because SBBR might be stretching it a bit too much for a desktop use case. Um, so yeah, we were discussing that, and yeah. I guess we just defaulted to what we have now. Yeah, the, the, the I, other I thing think is I'd like, like to have a chat with you guys for a few minutes afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, the, 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 other, the other part of it is we don't want to start at SBBR and work our way down because you're starting at multi-thousand dollar parts and trying to cut those down to something that is going to be affordable is going to be difficult. But those same people who make those parts make the cheaper ones, and we're trying to have conversations with them for, like, Octeon TX is a great example that started from the server side and got cut down to something that's more affordable. And Qualcomm had server parts that were SBSA, so now we're saying, okay, you've, you know how to do it, can we take some of your stuff down here and move it up to get to that compliance? It's not gonna happen overnight, the goal is to get there, and if we have something where we can get there instead of just talking about it and having conference meetings, then there might be ability to have, to have movement on it. Right. Is, is our, Money talks is basically what it boils down to. I'll, I'll just finish and, and say that I think even those platforms you're talking about, you, your starting point is not SBBR, SBSA compliant, but it's closer to those than to EBBR. Okay. So, yeah. so I, I think it's borderline problematic that you keep talking about EBBR, yeah. not, be, not for you, but for people listening and thinking and making decisions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we've kind of thought of this as being a superset of EBBR. The primary reason why... Think of it why, as a subset of SBSA. Yeah, or a subset of SBSA. But to be perfectly honest, like most of what we need is in SBSA, which is why we're saying a, a superset of it. Like SBSA doesn't talk about graphics because you typically don't need graphics on a server. So that's where kind of like the superset idea comes from. You're absolutely right. Like there are fundamental hardware problems that are gonna make some of this stuff not work. But the idea is that we want to be able to build something where there is an ecosystem. Can you take any 96 board SOM, drop it onto this and use it? Yes. Are you gonna have the experience that we want you to have of you can drop any Linux distribution on it, you can drop any graphics card in it and all just works? No. Um, we're going to have to do qualification of specific SOMs and work with those folks in order to get to the point to have what we want. But we're starting with what's available and then building upon it from there. So it's not so much that, we, you know, yes, you can throw any SOM on there. It's not going to be the experience we want you to have. Yeah, the SOM is purely from a hardware point of view. Um, you're not talking about software. Um, software is something that we'll uh, sort of specify on what goes on there and yeah. what should work. And, and the other reason for saying EBBR is because that's what the SOM spec says. I'm well aware of that. Uh, a question about uh, where did you get the money to run this project? Who will fund you? So we're, we're mostly being funded by Packet. Um, okay. We're going through and putting together this, this stuff on, on Packet's dime. Packet is sponsoring the, the work. At the moment now, it's just a bunch of engineering, which is fairly easy for us to, to absorb. There's gonna be hardware development costs. We plan on engaging the 96 boards and the Lenaro ecosystem to help with that um, and kind of go from there. So that's, that's where the money's coming from at the moment. Thank you. And I think we're out of time, according to the thing, that we're now at negative three. Um, but feel free to come talk to us. Our booth is right across the table. We'll be hanging out. We would love to have more conversations. We definitely want critical feedback, both positive and negative. Thank you very much.